Good afternoon, everybody. You're listening to Natural Sports here on WEG on 91.1 FM. I'm the host, Jared Dillard, as always, here to bring you the latest in sports. Mostly just college football, because who doesn't love college football this time of year? It's November. The rivalry games are picking up. Um, you know, the, the college football playoffs are in full swing. The rankings are out every week. People are arguing. SEC is good. No, the Big 12 is good. And all that rabble-jabble. And I don't even know where I got that word from. But first things first, as always, we talk about Auburn football and their latest escapade against number 19, Texas A&M. Last week, last week I didn't even pick Auburn to win this game. I wasn't very confident, especially with the with the rumors that Sean White was hurt and that uh, that he wasn't going to play. So... I'm going to run you through my day on Saturday, okay? So I'm sitting there, and the Auburn A&M game is about to come on. I'm sitting, I'm at my sister's house, okay? Auburn A&M game about to come on. It's 7.30. If you didn't know, I live in the Eastern Time Zone. So it, it's 7.30 over there, but 6.30 uh, Central Time. And uh, I get a message from Bleacher Report on my phone. Jeremy Johnson to start against Texas A&M. And I'm going to be honest, and I'm pretty sure we all had the same reaction. We let out a little bit of a groan when uh, we heard that news. It's, it's not a groan because I don't like Jeremy Johnson. I think he's probably one of the most likable people on the team because he didn't, like, every time something goes wrong, he puts it on himself. He doesn't put it on the coaching staff. He doesn't put it on any of his players. He doesn't put it on schoolwork or anything else. It's his fault. It's always going to be his fault. And even when he got benched, it was he was behind Sean White 110%. Every time Sean White came to the sideline, Jeremy Johnson was there, you know, dapped him up, you know, gave him a high five. You know, he got him excited. He always talked to him. You always saw that. So I, I like Jeremy Johnson. But when you heard, oh, he's going to start in the game, now you're just like, oh, well, here we go. We're playing a ranked team. We're playing A and M. This is just not going to end very well for Auburn. Well, Pop or the contrary beliefs, Auburn actually played pretty well against Texas A and M. Auburn came away with a W twenty six to ten, shutting down the A and M offense and then just finding a way to get that running game going, that 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 running game by committee. Jeremy Johnson had 130 yards passing and a touchdown, and I, I thought it was a very interesting. And when I heard some other people talk about this, and that Jeremy Johnson's stats weren't impressive, you know, 130 32 yards and touchdown for a quarterback. Even in, like in college football, that's just not a lot. When you have quarterbacks thrown for 300, 400, or like, if you're Baylor or TCU throwing for 500 yards, you know, almost a game. And, uh, yeah, when you look at it, 132 yards and a touchdown, that's not a lot. But you have to look at what he did. He managed the ball well. He didn't turn it over. He completed most of his passes. There was a couple passes that he could have threw a lot better. His accuracy was a little shaky on some of those passes. But he played a lot better. He didn't make uh, he didn't make mistakes, and another good thing is that Auburn finally established that run game that's eluded them all this year. And Javon Robinson was a big part of that. He had 159 yards and a touchdown. Peyton Barber also had a good chunk of yards on the ground as well. You know, and they, they were rotating them in and out, in and out, in and out, and the game went very well for Auburn, not only offensively but defensively. You know, you hold A&M, who's known for their breakout offense because of their wide receiver core, you hold them to 10 points. And you made their quarterback throw multiple interceptions. And to the point where, uh, you know, to the point where A&M was, finding, was try, just trying to find a way to get back in the game by the second half. And it, everything they tried to do was futile, you know? And now here, here's the thing about Auburn. Now this week you obviously play Georgia. 
and Georgia is kind of Georgia's kind of in the same boat as Auburn. They were picked to do very well. I don't think they were picked to win the East, but they were picked to do very well in their division. Got a couple of injuries. They lost a couple of games. They don't look as powerful. They're in a quarterback flux right now. But Georgia and Auburn pretty much have been down the same road this year. And so now they're both going to meet at Jordan Hare tomorrow. 11 a.m. kickoff at noon for me. Thank goodness. And, uh, you know, Georgia and Auburn are going to go at it. So the question now comes to this. Who do you play? It's a really good question. Do you play Sean White? Or do you play Jeremy Johnson? Do you really want to risk Sean White if he's still dealing with a bugging injury? Or do you play Jeremy Johnson who played well for your team last game? It almost kind of makes you think back to the Ole Miss game and if, you know, if they would have put Jeremy Johnson in, would it have been a different game? Because Sean White still played well against Ole Miss. Let's not take that away from him. But being hurt couldn't have helped um, him playing the A&M game, aggravating the injury most likely. So who do you play? Well, if you ask me, and this, I, I, this is for two reasons, I'll play Jeremy Johnson. A, because he managed the team so well against A&M. He kind of... He kind of deserves that right to get a second look at him. And B, you don't want to you don't want to get Sean White hurt. Like the kids is a, is the, the kid is going to be around for a long time. You don't want to you don't want to get him hurt now. Like what's the point of that? You're one win away from being bowl eligible. You're playing Georgia, who you can obviously beat. They're not a very they're 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 not up there like we thought they were. You play Idaho. Which, you know, I would say that's a win, but then again, I also thought Jacksonville State was a win, and although it was, I didn't feel good about it. And you play Alabama. You have two out of three really good chances to get that sixth win. And I, I don't think it's worth playing Sean White at this point. I think you let him some of the sidelines, you let him rest up, you let him get healthy before you throw him back into a game like that. You know? I know, if Auburn doesn't go to a bowl game, the season's the, the season's already been a bust. But to not go to a bowl game, that's even worse. And I know, I know a lot of people don't want that to happen. But I would rather not go to a bowl game than to see Sean White go out there and potentially get even worse when it comes to his injury. I'm not going to risk that. I'm not going to risk that at all. And then the thing is, even if Auburn does, let's say we win seven games. Let's, let's, let's say we, we, we win the next two games with Alabama, we're seven and five. We're bowl eligible. Is the season considered a success at that point? I mean, like, we were picked to win SEC. We fell really short of that. I mean, at this point, I'll take bowl eligibility. I, I don't think anybody would not. And going into this Georgia game, I would play Jeremy Johnson, and this is what I would do differently. Somehow, some way, you have to make him a threat, and he has a he has a, he has a huge arm. So there, there's that deep threat, which we get we got to learn how to make some more big plays because we it seems like we struggle at that. Auburn used to be all about the big plays, and now it's just we get them sporadically. You also got to get him involved in the run game. You know, there, there, a lot, Auburn does a lot of read options and sweeps, and we have really yet to see the quarterback keep the ball on a lot of these read options and sweeps. You know, there's not a lot of quarterback designed to run plays that Auburn has, and I think that may be a big reason because uh, that team has zeroed in on the run. Anum wasn't able to do it. But I think that's a really big reason why uh, Auburn has had little success down the field is because when you have a dual threat option like Jeremy Johnson is, or like, let's say, uh, Nick Marshall was, 
you know, you got to commit not only to the run game for the running back, but also the quarterback. And when you have to commit to two players on the ground like that, and the cornerbacks are constantly looking into the background, I mean, not, not the background, they're constantly looking to the backfield, then it's going to open up that wide receiver to streak down the field and to hit a big pass, especially when play action set up. And I, and I think Auburn just needs more of that. The good thing for Auburn is that George is dealing with his own problems. Nick Chubb obviously is out. And they're in, they, they have a big quarterback problem over in UGA, over in Athens. And uh, they're not going to figure it out soon. I mean, yeah, Georgia got a pretty good win over, I think, Kentucky last week. And, uh, but their quarterback only threw for about 60, 70 something yards. I don't think you can. I know Auburn hasn't played well, especially with Carl Lawson being back. There's no way you'd expect your quarterback to pass for that many uh, that many yards and expect to to beat Auburn. I I think there there you can't establish the run game. But with Georgia, I don't think Georgia will be able to establish a run game, and that's going to be their downfall. If Georgia can't run the ball, they're not going to be very effective. He saw it in the Alabama game. Georgia could not run the ball against Alabama. So they had to pass it. And then they found out our passing game isn't very good either. How are we going to win this game? The answer is you don't win the game. At least it gets not Alabama. At least it gets not Alabama. I mean, granted, the situation wasn't very good. You were playing at home. It was downpouring rain. You were in it for a little bit, but then... Alabama just became Alabama and ripped through everybody. As for Auburn, the good thing is that they're playing at home. They're playing at home. They're one win away. If anything, if you want to look at it, this is Auburn's playoff game. You win and you're in. Not necessarily. You can be eligible and not be picked. But there's a good chance that there's a 6-6, six and 7-5 six, and five Auburn SEC team that they'll go to a bowl game. I don't know what bowl it would be, considering I'm pretty sure they will, they they may not go to the Outback Bowl, and they and you know you can always go to the. I wish I had my list of bowls in front of me. I think the Music City Bowl, I think that's the SEC Bowl. So if you're ready to go to Nashville, I think it's in Nashville. I actually don't know. I have no idea where it's at. If you're just ready to go to Tennessee, you know, in December, January, you know, here we go, Music City Bowl. Auburn will be there. Or we could just go to the Montgomery Bowl. Or the Montgomery Raycom Bowl. We could just go 45 minutes to Montgomery and play a bowl game. That'll save us a lot of gas. I mean, if you, you, man, you could. Actually, I kind of like that idea. Save some gas. You know? It'd be like a home game. Let me stop rambling and let me go to commercial right here. You're listening to National Sports here under the EGL 91.1 FM. Staying on course without support is tough. With help from family and community, you get valuable support for recovery from a mental or substance use disorder. Join the Voices for Recovery. Visible. Vocal. Valuable. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Grades, work, sports, bikinis. 18-year-old guys have a lot on their minds. Accidentally breaking the law probably isn't one of them. Yet that's exactly what young men will be doing if they fail to register with Selective Service. So if you know a guy turning 18, do him a favor. Remind him. Fortunately, it'll only take him a few minutes because that's all it takes to register at SSS.gov. Then he can get back to his distractions. I mean, homework. (laughs) SSS.gov. Register. It's the law. I'm so glad we left that stupid party. No joke. Hey, baby, are you an overdue library book? Because you got fine written all over you. Oh, barf. <laughs> what about that girl with the hoop earrings? Ridiculous. When she was dancing... Megan, I... look out. Look out! Uh, oh. oh, my God. Becky. Becky, are you okay? My arm. I think it's broken. Can you bend it? It's already bent. 
in the wrong direction. I can't believe this. I'm so sorry. I only had a few drinks. I was just buzzed. Really? Just buzzed? Yeah, I swear. Well, in that case, my arm is fine. Ah, that's better. You're really okay? You're serious, Becky? No, genius. I'm not serious. Ow! My arm, it hurts. Buzzed driving. Maybe we should stop acting like it's no big deal. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A public service announcement brought to you by the U.S. Department of Transportation, the Ad Council, and this station. And welcome back to National Sports Hand WEGL 91.1 FM. I'm your host, Jared Dillard, ready to jump into another game from last week. And before I go, just that that, that PSA, that commercial, uh, the one with the car accident, I gotta say, that's probably my favorite. I mean, yeah, it's cringing listening to somebody snap their bones back into place, but man, I I pretty much play that every show because I, I just think if I ever got into a car accident and somebody was buzzed and they told me, oh, I was just buzz driving, like that'll probably be my same reaction. Just, oh, you know, I'm fine to snap it back into place. And then they just snap it out. See if they, see if I discuss them. Anyway, going to the LSU Alabama game. Arguably, um, most likely a letdown for some people who are looking for a game. Number two, uh, number two LSU played number two Alabama, and number number what am I even thinking? Like it's it's Friday, it's Friday, it's cold outside, it snuck up on me, it snuck up on all of us really. I just can't even think straight right now. Thanksgiving, like Thanksgiving breaks. Right around the corner. I think everybody's just gunning for that right now. Uh, number two LSU played number four Alabama. Number four Alabama came away with the win, thirty to sixteen. Derrick Henry had two hundred and ten yards rushing and three touchdowns. Leonard Fournette, who was seen as the Heisman front runner, nineteen carries, thirty one yards, and a touchdown. Yeah, yeah, I said that. 31 yards and a touchdown. Leonard Fournette, a guy who ran for over 150 yards constantly, and, you know, through straight games, 31 yards rushing. 31. And you, you want to know why he had 31 yards rushing? It was because of Alabama's front seven. Who I repeatedly say has the best front seven in college football. Granted, their defense can get burned to there. We've seen it happen countless of times. Their defense, their secondary will always be the weakest part of that team next to their kicking game. I'm sorry, Adam Griffith, although he's gotten better. But their secondary is going to get them beat one of these days. Today, or last Saturday, which is not that day, because that front seven is so dangerous. They're so good. I'm. I don't know. I. I can't think of another team that can that could compare that could compete with Alabama's front seven, like front seven defense versus front seven defense. I don't know another team that can. They're just that good. This is a lot considering I go to Auburn University, but you know, I, you know, I'm a realist. I say how it is, and I give credit where credit is due. I want to. I, I mean, do you see what happens when Alabama's front seven come off the ball? The whole offensive line is pushed backwards. I mean, it's like a freight train that Alabama front seven is. The defensive lineman gets to the quarterback and they plug up holes. The linebackers, you know, play the holes in the line. And that running back, Leonard Fournette was going nowhere that game. You know, I think it was at halftime. He had under an average of one yards rushing. And then he had, he finally had that break of, oh, I think four yards. And everybody started clapping like, oh, yeah, four yards. Like, that. that's what this game came to. Leonard Fournette, 31 yards. For me, after seeing this game, 
Alabama to me is the number one team in the nation. I know there's Clemson. No, I know people are going to disagree with that. Like Noah, Noah Gardner, GH Sports. I don't know what time it is. I'm sorry, Noah. I try to give you a shout out. I like he. Great point. Clemson should be number one. They're undefeated. They play some pretty good games. But like, if if I sat it down, if I put down all these teams and just wipe the records away. You know what? I was just like, if I took somebody who watched college football a lot, but didn't know the records, which is impossible because everybody knows everybody's records if you watch college football. But if I just took each team and covered up their records and said, who do you think the best team is? I'm sure that a lot of people would say Alabama. If we covered up the rankings, we covered up the record, a lot of people say, you know what? Alabama's the best team. And then Clemson right after that. I think Clemson is a good team. I think there's and you know, I, I think they're a really good team. I think they deserve to be the top four. Yeah, even top two. But Alabama, it's kinda hard after what they did to a Heisman contender all in it for net, who had hundred and fifty plus yards in consecutive games and then shut them down to thirty one. It's hard to say, oh well, you know, Clemson's still the better team. I don't know. You could make the argument that Leonard Fournette played a couple of bad defenses in the SEC, and and he wasn't as good as what the stats led on. But it's still impressive what Alabama did to LSU. Let's just focus on the fact that at one point, I think it was near the second half, you know, CBS pulled up the graphic and LSU has 39 yards, 39 total yards. I don't know how many yards they finished with. But they didn't have a lot in the first half. They didn't have a lot. Granted, they burned Alabama a couple of times through the air, which, again, I'll say the, the secondary for Alabama is going to be their worst aspect. But Alabama is the epitome of what I've been saying the past couple of weeks, and it's that defense wins championships. And I'm like, when, when I say that, you got to think that. You got to think that uh, um, defenses, you, you need an offense. I mean, that's a given. When I say defense wins championships, I'm not saying just only straight-up defense wins championships. Go ahead and clarify that. What I'm saying is, if you have a great defense, if you have the best defense in the nation, it's a pretty good chance that you're going to the playoffs. Whereas if you're TCU and you have the best offense but not really a good defense, you're going to get beat. It was just that, then that, that was the case. TCU has the best offense, hands down. I'll give them that. Although I don't like how they oh, it was different now because they're not. But I thought they were highly ranked and they, they, they shouldn't be there. And then they got beat, so it's okay now. But they had the best offense in the nation. I'll give them that. If a team had Alabama's defense and TCU's offense, they're unstoppable. But TCU's downfall was that they didn't have a defense. And although you can win eight, nine games with a great offense, eventually a team was going to show up that was going to burn your defense and then stop your offense. All a team had to do was stop the offense. If you can stop TCU's offense, you could win. And Oklahoma State showed up, and they're like, you know what? We're going to stop you. And they did. Granted, TCU uh, lost Dotson for the game when he got a wrist injury. He's coming back next week. But TCU's defensive problems caught up to him, and it burned them. And I'm going to say they're not going to be in the college football playoffs. They're not. And to be quite honest, it looks like the Big 12 is not going to be in it either as the Big 12 is just about to beat up on each other anyway. And also having this discussion with Noah how um, which conference is going to get left out of the of the playoff picture. And then I thought about it, and it's not going to be one conference. It's going to be two. And I think Notre Dame will be in there in the end. Notre Dame is going to be in the, in, the, in, the, in the playoffs by the time this is over. The two conference champions will be left out. And let's say it's going to be the Big 12 and the Pac-12. Notre Dame plays Stanford at the end of the year. 
And Stanford looks like they're poised to win the Pac-12 right now. And you can't put a two-loss Stanford who, who lost to Notre Dame over a one-loss Notre Dame just because they're Pac-12 champions. It just doesn't work that way. The Big 12's problem is that, A, they played a really easy schedule. B, they don't have a conference championship game. And C, all the good teams, and, and I, I understand that they make these schedules years in advance, but all the good teams are playing each other at the end of the year, which hurts them the most. If Baylor played Oklahoma in like the third game of the year, it wouldn't matter much now because we know both teams are good. But that loss hurts so much more at the end of the year than the beginning of the year, you know? Then, then again, that's the reason why, because I don't take much stock in early games. Like last year when Ohio State lost to Virginia Tech. I didn't, put much, I didn't put much stock into that game because it's so early in the year and they don't have preseason or anything. You know, they go in there cold turkey and expect to win. Now, after being in practice and just hitting each other, it's different when you go hit somebody else. So after I went off on that tangent, going back to Alabama, defense. Defense can get you somewhere. It's like when well, I was talking to Noah today, and I gave him an analogy. He said it was stupid, but I think it was great. So I said, "High school or high school college football is like a shootout. Take say you take Taylor, uh, uh, TCU, and Baylor, and they both have all their players, and they're all healthy, and they play each other. It's gonna be a shootout." Well, wouldn't you think TCU had the better chance of winning that game if it wasn't a shootout? Think of a, a, a duel at dawn type scenario where, you know, you're the town sheriff, but I take down this bad guy and you're at a duel. It's easier to win a shootout when your opponent doesn't have any ammunition. Is that not true? If you take away your opponent's offense in this uh idea a gun with some ammo you take away the ammo they can't shoot they can't win a shootout if the defense takes away the offense in a shootout then you win there's no other there's no other way the other team can win <coughs> and that's the reason why I think teams like Baylor and TCU will never be in the playoff picture as long as their defenses continue to struggle. Last year, they were probably pretty irate that they didn't get in the comfortable playoffs now. Well, this year, I mean, they, they can't complain because their defenses have been exposed. And Baylor, especially losing your starting quarterback, is, is going to hurt. I, I feel like Baylor's the better of the two. I feel like Baylor actually has a little bit of a defense but not enough to be able to keep up in a, in, a, in a playoff scenario. I don't think it just works like that. And I think that's the reason why Oregon has struggled uh, this year as well. Although the defense plays, I mean, although the offense plays well, the defense has always lagged behind the offense with Oregon. And uh, I think it really started to play a factor now in the offense started relying more on the defense this year. And then realizing that, oh, our defense really has as good as we thought it was. So now Oregon, they're, they're still, they could still win the Pac-12, I think, at this point. But Oregon's now sitting in this predicament where they know their offense is going to get better because it's Oregon. People go to Oregon because they have a high-powered offense. But now they're sitting in a position where they know they got to get that defense better. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and when we come back, We'll go over to four and out of the first four teams in my college football playoffs and the first four teams sitting outside waiting to see if they can get in this weekend. Listen to National Sports here on WEGL 91.1 FM. One day, I'll teach chemistry to kids. I'm going to be an architect. My dream is to be a chef. At the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Federal Student Aid, we provide more than $150 billion each year in grants, loans, and work-study funds, making higher education possible for anyone at any stage of life. I can go back to college. 
I can change careers. I can make a difference. Federal Student Aid, proud sponsor of the American Mind. Learn more about money for college at studentaid.gov. Green light. Hey girl, school zone. I'm getting hungry. Car changing lanes. You want to meet me for pizza? Stop sign. Intersection clear. Yeah, street. Pizza sounds good. Ball in street? Girl in street! <gasps> it's hard to concentrate on two things at once, like texting and driving. Stop the text, stop the wrecks. How will you stop texting and driving? Tell us at stoptextstoprex.org. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Well, here we are again, and i got to tell you, Jim, this match has me really concerned. That's right, Ron. In one corner, we have a powerful heavyweight, a train, weighing in at a whopping 6,000 tons. And in the other, this hasty lightweight challenger, a car at just one and a half tons. This does not bode well for the car or the people in it. Ron, this is one of those rare moments where I actually find myself at a loss for words. This driver can't think he can beat a train. I can hardly bear to watch. It's no contest. Every day, people are injured or killed trying to beat a train at rail crossings. Trying to beat a train is more dangerous than you think. See tracks, think train. For more safety tips and information, visit ctracksthinktrain.org. And welcome back to WEG on National Sports. I'm your host, Jared Dillard. And before we go to the segment named Four and Out, where I give my first my first four teams of the College Football Playoffs in the next four looking, uh, looking in, I got an update that the NFL issued a statement about last night's game. So... If you didn't know, last night game, the Bills, the Jets, they played each other. And if you see the highlights, they look a little odd because the Bills and the Jets were playing in their color rush uniforms, which I have no idea what they, well, I don't know what color rush means. I guess they're just going to wear, like, all their primary colors. So the Jets are, like, all green and the Bills are, like, all red. So... What happened was, people started to realize that some colorblind people had a really tough time figuring out which team was which. And I never really even thought about it until now. So, like, a lot of people were just like, what about people who are colorblind? Especially for people who have a really hard time dealing with red and blue. Or red and uh, green. And it's like, wow. Yeah, they did not account for that. So the NFL went and released a statement via ESPN's Dan Ravel saying, The colorless jerseys are a test for four games this season, the first, was, the first of which was last night. We did test the jerseys this summer on field and on television. The standard television test did not account for color blindness for fans at home, that have become, uh, which has become apparent last night. We will enhance our testing to include a color blindness analysis to better address this issue in the future and like I didn't really think about it until now and I'm just like yeah oh, there's like a little even a video to go with it like yeah I'm looking at this video I can't tell who is who because they all look like they're just wearing gray uniforms so I can see how that would be a problem um this uh article is via Bleacher Report and if you follow Deadspin on Twitter, they also have the video up there for you to see. So go check it out. But like, I'm just looking at it. And if you look at the helmets, yeah, you could tell. But, like, the, the the camera angles are so far away. You can't tell who is who. Yeah, that that's that's too That, no, no. Yeah, the, the NFL really dropped the ball on that one. Um, They really should have took into account that, hey, you know, some people... Or a lot of people who watch your game are actually colorblind. You know, we should probably think about this, and they didn't. So, there you go. Bye, Roger Goodell. Hashtag Bye, Roger Goodell. He has nothing to do with this. Um, so, four and out. So, my first four teams, you can already probably guess who's number one. 
Number one is Alabama. Their defense is just way too good. And, I, and you know, when Derrick Henry, excuse me, when Derrick Henry rushes for 210 yards and three touchdowns, gosh, and now I have hiccups. That actually hurt. You ever have a hiccup where you just hiccup really hard and it just hurts? Like, that's what I have right now. And it's like just getting on my nerves. So, Alabama, when you have Derrick Henry, who rushed it for three, uh, 210 yards and three touchdowns, like, and, and then you have Coker, who he, like like I said a couple weeks ago, or last week, I can't even remember anymore. It's been such a long day. When you have Coker, he doesn't need to throw for 300 yards and a couple touchdowns. He just needs to be a game manager. He needs to manage the offense and make sure it's pumping on all cylinders, makes the throws that he needs to make, and just hand the ball off. In other words, he he and Jeremy Johnson were like the same people last week. No, Jeremy Johnson was a game manager. He made the throws he had to make, but running was their primary objective, and they did that. He managed the offense. He didn't turn over. He made sure he got in the right calls. Game manager. If you think about Alabama's old quarterbacks, they they were never great, great, great Heisman winning quarterbacks. It was their running backs because Alabama's quarterbacks has always been game managers. They're there to manage the offense. Number two, no surprise, I have Clemson. I understand Clemson's undefeated. I understand they play some really good teams and beaten them. But if if I if we throw Clemson and Alabama up there, no records, no rankings, who do I think the better team is? I would say Alabama. Clemson's defense scares me. It does. After the NC State game, I've been a little bit weary of Clemson, of Clemson. I think they're a really good team. They'll be in the college football playoffs. I would really like for Clemson and Alabama to meet in the national championship, which it looks like that's most likely going to happen anyway. Because Clemson and Alabama are probably going to stay at 1-2 and two for the rest of the season. Unless one of them loses. They both got to play championship games. And they are never a pushover. So let's go ahead and remember that. But yes, I know. Clemson undefeated. But that, that shouldn't be the only reason why Clemson is number one. You know? A lot of people say they're undefeated. They deserve to be number one. Just because you're undefeated does not de- mean you deserve to be number one. Although, I'll admit, if you flip-flop Alabama and Clemson on your rankings, I'm totally fine with that. I'm totally fine with that. You know? Because cause they, they, if, if there could be two number one teams, then that would be the perfect scenario. One, one, and three, and four, and you should keep going from there. But if we were honestly doing these rankings, and we put the best teams up there. In my opinion, Alabama would just be first. Clemson being second, I think I, that's what I think. If you put Clemson first and if put Alabama second, I'm totally fine with that. If you put either one of those teams outside the top four, then I think we have a problem because they are the two best teams in college football. Number three, I have Notre Dame. Now, I know in the very beginning of this year, I think I always said Notre Dame's ranked too high. I don't like that. I got to see them play a couple of games first. Now that that's, you know, gone and passed, I think I can put Notre Dame up at three and feel good about it. You know, and it, it makes sense. Like last week I had them at four. LSU lost. LSU drops out. Notre Dame moves up a ranking. As long as they keep winning. And they have to play Stanford. Stanford's going to solidify their spot in the college football playoffs. They can win out. Like, if they can can go run the table, beat Stanford, then that's it. Notre Dame's in. Because Stanford most likely will walk away with the Pac-12 championship. I feel like. And Stanford is one of is Stanford would be a marquee signature win. Number four, and I don't feel particularly happy about this one, it's Ohio State. This one, this one was hard because n- number four is Ohio State. Number five is Oklahoma State. And this one was hard 
because I actually don't know which one's better. Like, I've ripped Ohio State all year long about not playing good teams and playing sloppily. But then Oklahoma State comes in, they knock off TCU, but I never thought TCU was that good to begin with. How can I move Oklahoma State so far up the ranking when I didn't even think the team that they beat was really good in the first place? They jumped up there, but I didn't feel good about putting them in the top four for that specific reason. Because I knew they were going to beat TCU. TCU's defense was not going to catch up. But just because they beat TCU does not mean I feel good about putting them in the top four. Let's wait until after this week. We'll see what happens, and then I may put them in the top four above Ohio State. How sick I play Illinois. They'll probably struggle with that one until the end. But we'll see. The number four Ohio State, number five Oklahoma State. If you flip flop them for Oklahoma State, five Ohio State, that's fine. I just feel like Ohio State's the better bet this week. Obviously, that must likely change by next week. Number six, I have LSU. They lost to Alabama, but Alabama, in my eyes, is the best team in the nation. So when you lose to the best team in the nation, I think it doesn't hurt you as much. I mean, I think LSU is still a top quality team. You know? Will they be in the college football playoffs this year? Um, No, unless some crazy stuff happens, I just don't see it. Unless some really crazy stuff happens with uh, Clemson, Notre Dame, Ohio State. I mean, I just don't see it. Um, I think in the real rankings are ninth. In mine, they're six, But I don't think they'll ever find their way back in in either of our own rankings. Like, I, I just feel once you crown champions, that championship means so much. Like, when you play a championship game, you win, and you can say you're SEC champion, Big Ten champion, uh, Big Big 12, even though they don't have a championship game. If you're a Big 12 champion, Pac-12 champion, or ACC champion, I just think that just means so much. That boosts your, like, standing. Number seven, I have Baylor. Baylor, obviously, they don't have their starting quarterback. They're fine, but... Guess what? They got to play Oklahoma this weekend. So we're really going to see who the better team is now. Um, I'm going to get into my game picks later uh, after another commercial break, after we're done with this. But uh, Baylor's sitting at 7. Iowa. Iowa's at 8. Um, I know Iowa's 5th for the college ball committee. I, I just think I, 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 I want to see Iowa play some more more talents just to see where they're at I mean they, they they don't have the toughest schedule and they don't have the weakest but I think it's pretty uh, media core or media I don't know if I said that I think it's a pretty average schedule um so we'll see how it shakes out for Iowa and then if you want to know the other team sitting out there I had Stanford at 9 Utah at 10 and although I didn't write it down, Oklahoma was at like 11 for me. Um, when they beat Baylor, they'll, they'll jump up a little bit. You know, Oklahoma will find its way in. And they still got a couple a couple of games to play. So, you know, we'll see where it goes there for Oklahoma. Um, but that's my four and out, my top four teams. And the next four looking in. Ready for clutch football playoffs to, to kick off. And, uh, you know, it's getting really exciting here in the, in the world of college sports. Especially Auburn. Plays tonight against UAB, 8.30 uh, tip time. And, uh, you know, college, college sports is starting to pick up again. You know, it was, it was low for a little bit for Auburn sports. You know, Auburn football not doing so hot. But here comes basketball. You know, men's and women's. Men's tip off of that 8.30. The women play earlier than that. So, you know, that's going to be fun to check out tonight. You're listening to National Sports here on WEGL 91.1 FM. We're going to go to a quick commercial break, and then we're going to come back with uh, my game picks for the week.
buying Girl Scout cookies probably looks very simple. You just buy a few boxes from a Girl Scout and that's it, right? But you wouldn't believe the skills we learn by the whole experience of selling them. Ask us about our inventory. We have something for every taste. Notice our new boxes. They tell the story of what we do. Ask us where the money goes. Our team gets to decide. When a Girl Scout sells you cookies, she's building a lifetime of skills and confidence. This is what a girl can do. Girl Scout cookie season is here. Find your cookies at girlscoutcookies.org. It takes many hands to build a healthy life. Recovery from mental and substance use disorders is possible with the support of my community. Join the voices for recovery. Visible. Vocal. Valuable. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-4357. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The thought of my sons growing up without me inspired me to quit smoking. I talked to my doctors and then I threw away all my cigarettes, ashtrays, and lighters. I started exercising instead of smoking. Getting support from friends online kept me on track. Staying away from alcohol when I was first quitting was key. Instead of smoking after I ate, I'd get up and take a walk. I missed having a cigarette in my hand, so I'd hold a pen or a straw, anything. Until I knew I wouldn't give in to temptation, I spent more time with my friends who didn't smoke. I went to places that were smoke-free. I didn't stay quit the very first time I tried. I kept on trying, and I learned something each time. Do whatever it takes. No matter how many times it takes. I quit. I quit. I quit. We did it. So can you. You can quit. For free help, call 1-800-QUIT-NOW. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and CDC. And welcome back to WEGO National Sports. Wait. Time out. Let me do that again. <laughs> Welcome back to Next Sports and here WEGL 91.1 FM. I'm your host, Jared Dillard. Getting into the game picks for this weekend's college football games. Up first, number two, at, uh, Alabama at number 17, Mississippi State. It's a 3.30 kickoff time. All times are Eastern because I live in a weird part of Alabama. Thank you, Smith Station, for that. Uh, so 2.30 your time. I'm going to pick Alabama to win this game. It's it's interesting because Mississippi State has had a pretty quiet year, but they're sitting at seven and two, and uh, they're playing at home. And you're thinking, oh man, Mississippi State can pull off the upset. Well, no, I think I think Alabama has it pretty well in hand. But uh, you know, this is the uh, football doubleheader. Pretty much, you've seen the commercials. It's Auburn, Georgia at noon, and then Alabama, Mississippi State at three thirty. There will be two big back to back games for the SEC right there. Um As for the next game, it's Arkansas at number nine LSU. That's at seven fifteen. This is a big game for the Razorbacks. Because the Razorbacks have played so many teams uh really close. And they're coming off that big win against Ole Miss and LSU's coming off that hard loss to Alabama. And, it, and part of me wants to pick Arkansas because they play every team really close so well. But I'm going to go LSU on this one. I think they'll finally get back on track. And I think Leonard Fournette's going to have a, a really big game coming uh, out of this. The next game, which people were looking forward to really, uh, really uh, earlier in the season, was uh, number 21 Memphis and number 24 Houston. It thought, they thought college game day, I'm not even sure what college game day is at. It could very well be in Houston. I, I've actually forgotten where they're at. But this is a big game that people are looking forward to. They, they thought this game would decide which one of these teams would be in the college football playoffs. It hasn't worked out that way. Houston's kind of flatlined a little bit. They're, they're undefeated, but they're sitting at 24, and Memphis... Is coming off an upset. Um, so I'm going to take Memphis in this one. I think they are the better team. Um, I haven't seen Houston play a lot. And Memphis has been a team everybody's been talking about. Um, but I'm going to pick Memphis in this one. It should be a good game. It's a 7 o'clock game. So it, it, it's a prime time game for these two teams. These two programs have done a really fantastic job this year. 
The next game is number 12, Oklahoma, at number 6, Baylor. And here we go. I'm picking Oklahoma to win this game. Oklahoma is just a better team. Baylor's offense is is going to be, they're going to be good. Because their backup quarterback, is really, he's good. He's a freshman, and he plays great football. But the defense and just the offense not producing because he's going to make mistakes, it's going to hurt them. I think Oklahoma is just going to be a better team. And don't be surprised if Oklahoma wins the Big 12 because they seem like the team to beat right now. Other than that, Oklahoma State, that's going to be Oklahoma. Oklahoma State is most likely going to decide what happens with the Big 12. And the worst case scenario is that Oklahoma loses to Baylor but beats Oklahoma State and then it throws a, it throws the Big 12 all in disarray, which is a good reason why the Big 12 needs a conference championship game to get that one more game out of the way, to, to put the best two teams against each other and just let them dog it out in the championship game. Last game, uh, the Oklahoma-Baylor game is at 8 o'clock. Then the last game, 10:45, which is 9:45 over here in Auburn, Washington State plays number 19 UCLA. And for this one, I'm going to pick Washington. Washington State, they're a really good team. They have a high-powered offense. Washington State is another team that has a really good offense, but the defense is kind of lackluster. Um, but UCLA, UCLA and Cal have both surprised me. They both have been, you know, struggling here and there. They're both to compete for the for the Pac-12, and uh, I'm gonna pick Washington State here. I think they have really good offense. I think UCLA is gonna struggle a little bit, and uh, I'm, I'm just gonna go Washington State here. A couple of final topics before I go. Uh, so this week, um, Des, you probably heard yesterday, Des Bryant explodes on the media. There was that story. Uh, the Missouri protest, their president and chancellor is out right now. That dealt with the Missouri football team. For, for a little bit, people are wondering if Missouri will even play a football game this weekend. We know that's going to be a big story. Missouri is sitting at 5-4. and four. They need bowl eligibility. They're playing a good BYU team. So it's, it's interesting that this game is probably going to be one of the headlines for Saturday. It's just... Missouri is going to play this football game. And you got to think, when you watch that broadcast, it's going to be brought up probably around 50 times that there, there, was, a, there was a protest going on. Um, another one, if you haven't watched AU Nation on Eagle Eye TV Channel 6 or go to eagleeyetv.com, the final question on AU Nation was the NFL and whether they disciplined their players well enough and if you want my take on it, it, this question mostly revolved around Greg Hardy and Ray Rice, which have been two high-profile um, cases dealing with uh, NFL players and their and their actions. Most like most notably, domestic violence. These two uh, have committed. Ray Rice, you know, he was suspended. Greg Hardy was suspended, and then. He didn't play for the Panthers. He like sat up 14 games, I think. Uh, there's a whole situation behind that. Ray Rice, his fiance, forgave him. They went to counseling. They ended up getting married. Ray Rice says he wants to work with the NFL, you know, to stop this kind of stuff. And Greg Hardy was just is just being Greg Hardy, doing Greg Hardy things. I think it's really interesting how. Ray Rice, he doesn't have his career back anymore. Most notably because he is a running back. But if you ask, if you're asking me who would I rather have on my team, I would obviously say Ray Rice. I I think at heart, he's a good guy. Uh, I'm the kind of guy that gives second chances to people. I, if I was ever put in that kind of situation or something like that happened to a friend of mine or a loved one, I I can't sit here and say. I would think the same thing because I'm human and things change. But I feel like Ray Rice, you know, will he ever make up for what he did? Maybe not in the heart of the public, but I, I think he's done his best to, uh, you know, to, to right the wrong. And I can at least commend him on that. 
his wife has been there with him, his fiance, and uh, I can commend him on that. Greg Hardy is a whole nother story. That's a ship waiting to 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 sink any moment, you know. Kind of to the point where you, you I I want the the Dallas Cowboys to like put him in therapy or something because he seems like he needs it, you know. Well, that's it for Nashville Sports here on WEGL 91.1 FM. I'm your host, Jared Dillard. I'll be back next week, hopefully. Hopefully, just let me go because, you know, I'm just a bad host. But I'll be here next week, maybe with a couple people. Maybe I'll be alone again, but who knows? You've listened to National Sports here on WEGL 91.1 FM.